Good evening. I'd like to call to order the October 19th meeting of the New Canaan Board of Education. Uh, first on the agenda is to approve minutes from our last meeting, October 6th. Is there a motion? First, Sherry. Second, Julie. All in favor? Thank you. Next is to review and approve our agenda for this evening. Is there a motion? Carl, second, Brendan, all in favor? Next is comments from the public. To ensure the public's right to be heard, the board has set aside time during the meeting for public comments. Two minutes will be allotted to each speaker and a maximum of 15 minutes to each subject. Um, if you would. Thank you. Checking to see if there's anyone waiting to speak. Hmm. Comments may also be emailed to the NCPS BOE members at ncps k12.org. Okay. Seeing none, moving on to the first item on the agenda under reports and recognition. Uh, this evening we'll be hearing an update on the alternative program. So with that, um, we have a great group here. Dr. Lutze, would you like to make set this up? Or? Actually, I'll ask Mr. Tesper to great. do that for us. Thank you. I'd be happy to. As the, um, as the board recalls, the, the downtown campus was started in the 2018-19 school year. Um, to meet the increasing need we were seeing uh, for, of students that um, needed a therapeutically based program or students who um, needed a different style of an academic program. Um, so we created the downtown campus to meet that need. Um, and the board goal for the 1920 school year was to continue the development of the downtown campus, monitor the student success, and also to provide opportunities for students in the downtown campus to um, participate in extracurricular activities at the high school. Um, tonight, we have an outstanding group of educators here to present and let us know and update us on how the downtown campus is doing. We have Andrea McGilpin, who is the social worker and director of the downtown campus. We have Colleen Bailey, who is a special education teacher at the downtown campus. Evan Remley, who is a general ed teacher at the downtown campus. And Evan, along with Bob Stevenson, are two of the um, founding general education teachers. And the two of them working closely together over the last few years um, have, been, have been key to the success of the creation and the continued development of the program. So kudos to, to you and Mr. Stevenson. And then we also have uh, Mr. Sullivan, who is the assistant principal at the high school and also the liaison between the high school and the downtown campus. Um, I, will, I will turn it over to you guys to take us through all the great things you're doing on behalf of your students and the community. downtown campus. Um, it's hard to believe that we're already in our third year. I'm going to try to make sure we have everyone with this wide span. Um, so we're here to really talk about our program, how proud we are of our students and their accomplishments. Um, in total, we've had 20 students uh, come through downtown campus, um, each on their own journey. And I'm hopeful in the next 20-ish minutes that you'll get a real feel um, for how much we all love being there, but also how much the downtown campus has come to represent for students and their families as well as the New Canaan High School community. So this is our charter this year. We do this at the start of each year as an opportunity for our students to kind of come together for students that are returning to us and new students to talk about what we really want as goals for the year as, as well as kind of the space to feel like for them. We've created a program that has opened up space for kind of what I like to call a social emotional roadmap, as well as, well as empowering our students to engage in their academics. This year's charter, which we have the students do each year, as I said, focuses a lot on learning and being in a calm environment where students can reach goals, be considered of each other, be non-judgmental, and learn. What we see year after year is the need for students to be in a small environment that is accepting where they can build friendships, which ultimately enables them to reach their academic potential um, and be a part of their community. 
we become, as they call us, a family, and we build on that so we can help each of them climb their own developmental and academic ladder. To share a quote from a parent whose daughter has been with us all three years and will be graduating at the end of this year, it allowed my daughter to get back into a classroom and reach her full academic and social potential, a godsend. The environment is exceptionally supportive and caring toward all her individual needs. She has grown tremendously in the areas of self-confidence, advocating for herself, respecting others, and building relationships. With a dedicated and talented group of teachers, we have provided consistent and strong foundation for our students, which empowers them to meet their academic, social, and emotional goals. Our mission statement has held true and strong over the last four year, three years, and is something actually that our founding students created themselves. Students and teachers working together to create a safe and supportive environment that embraces individual differences. Collectively, we empower the overall growth and development of students so they can move forward and contribute to the world in meaningful ways. As a grandmother of a student who graduated last year said, the downtown campus has truly been a vital part of shaping and preparing my grandson for graduation and moving forward in his journey. So one of the things that is so important, kind of one of the pillars of our program, is this idea of empowering individuals and building relationships, really focusing on developing and strengthening our students' minds so that they can engage and respond to experiences rather than react. We've woven this into the program both in practice and behind the scenes. Explicitly, this is being done through our community morning meeting times, health classes, individually with me in terms of like more individual skill building. And some of the, of the areas that we focus on more deeply are building relationships by bringing strong awareness to interactions that they have. We help to create enough space between the situation and the response, as many of you might have heard kind of this meta moment. Um, so that rather than reacting, um, students can have a response that is more thoughtful. Adhering to more restorative practices Collaborative discussions, walk through, walking through situations to identify patterns and behaviors, understanding why we respond and more natural consequences, and for students to understand that the experience of interactions and resolutions can be meaningful and don't have to be confrontational. Interpersonal skills such as perspective taking and flexible thinking, how we can all express ourselves while being supportive and tolerant of other people's feelings and views. All of these things which help to increase their ability to focus, recognize and manage their emotions, make better decisions, and empathize in relationships. As a student that graduated in 2019 that's currently at SCAD said, as somebody with an anxiety disorder and ADHD, I found that the more intimate setting and reduced class size helped my ability to focus. It also allowed me to get to know and be more comfortable around my classmates. Overall, the downtown campus program helped improve my grades, was sufficiently accommodating, and genuinely a pleasure to be a part of. We spend a lot of time fostering our relationships with families and collaborating with outside providers. This allows us to bridge school and home as well as to align and continue interventions that other clinicians are working on so that we can help our students access their academics and be a part of their school experience. Some of the more kind of direct therapeutic approaches that we take um, are DBT skills, social emotional learning, mindfulness curriculum. Embedded throughout the program, as we talked a bit about, are kind of very similar to Mark Brackett's emotional inten intelligence framework is bringing opportunities organically and through classwork so our students can consider how their thoughts and feelings shape their interactions and relationships. We've worked in a focus and focus on individually and in small groups, again, on DBT skills, so looking at distress tolerance, emotion regulation, and interpersonal effectiveness. Social thinking, so kind of really thinking about the social emotional chain reaction of how our thoughts and actions impact other people. Mindfulness curriculum, really looking at helping students and adolescents gain perspective of gratitude and understanding how to get space to attend better and be more thoughtful about their responses, which in turn also positively influences their ability to concentrate, stay on task, and complete work that they feel good about. In addition, while we look to build our own community and be a part of main campus, as we call this beautiful building, we are also looking to grow in the New Canaan community. 
We've set up exploratory career activities throughout our couple of years. For example, we've had journalists come in. We had a class at Benefit Makeup Studio. We visited Ambulance Corps. Um, we had someone come in and discuss virtual reality with our students. They shattered at the veterinary hospital, volunteered at Mounted Troop, and we actually were set to do monthly volunteering at the food pantry, but then COVID happened. Um, so now Colleen is gonna walk you through more about how we create uh, academic opportunities for our students and the progresses and successes we've had over the past three years. Hello. Um, so many of our students have, for one reason or another, hit roadblocks at main campus. Um, their definition of school is either too fun and social and they don't make it to class. And, um, but for the majority, school brings up negative feelings, such as frustrating, difficult, anxiety provoking. So it's imperative to meet students where they are and help create a classroom environment that will allow them to reach their academic potential while being supported in individual and small group instruction while supporting them emotionally and, and um, socially. This is one of my favorite quotes. Um, everyone's a genius, but if you judge a fish on its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing it is stupid. Um, Albert Einstein. Um, another thing that we do that helps a lot is goal setting. So some of the students that come in that are new, um, especially for the, in the fall, because um, we've had a number of returning students, is trying to figure out what they want. And some of them, they, I want to be back at main campus as soon as possible. Some of them, I want to just finish high school. I'm one, of, I'm one of the first in my family to finish high school, and that's just I, what I want to do. And so once we know kind of their desire, it's much easier to build a relationship and build um, steps to get them there. Um, so we tend to do goals at the beginning, like for semester, for um, spring semester, summer, and post-graduation. And we try and go back to those and revisit the personal goals throughout the year. Um, and this will, um, helps us individualize a program for each student and also allows us to understand each student's desires and intentions to help them achieve their goals. Um, and then... Oh wait, and that was one of the quotes I like too, is look at your daily habits and ask yourself if they are causing you to evolve or revolve. Are you moving forward? Or are you just moving in circles? So many of our students, and it's just all humans really, but you just get into these patterns and it's so hard to break the patterns. And um, so sometimes just being in a smaller environment and having people, <laughs> on top of you in a way, but really checking in on you all the time, um, starts to break those habits and that's our goal sometimes. Um, who are some of our students? So there's student profile, social, emotional, um, and medical issues, school avoidance, stepping stones for students um, coming in and out of inpatient treatment, credit recovery. What? has historically been the case with any sort of group dynamics. An eclectic group is great, because then you get these students really having different viewpoints and having some, as I said, might be more social and some have difficulty in social situations. Um, but having a mixture of students is fantastic. Um, I was looking at just you know who some of our students have been over the last three years, and um, it's interesting, gender-wise, it's been split, like 10 male, 9 female, 1 non-binary. Um, and then grades, 12th graders, like only have been in with us for senior year. It was 11 students, um, 8 students who had multiple years, and then we have one new student, um, a 10th grader. We did start with a 9th grader. Um, we tried to... It ideally have them here for ninth grade, the students, but in this case, we did have a ninth grader start and is still with us. Um, another is the breakdown of special ed students and general ed students. It's been um, 
as you see the pie chart, like 75% special education, 25% um, general education. And um, students have been involved in senior internships. That's a big thing we push and it's hopefully as we move forward too, as Andrea um, started to talk about like having more and more time in the community and building on some of these experiences that we've had um, in career and um, hopefully other internships and community volunteering situations. So our graduates, we've had 100%, all 11 of 11 have graduated, which is great. Um, post high school, we've had, um, let's say 63% college working and then others applying to Job Corps and other situations like that. Um, but I was just gonna say, Andrea reached out to me in June after months of ups and downs with e-learning and quarantining. And after many concerns about our students, we were at a place of confidence knowing that our seniors were all going to graduate. Two of the seniors were already accepted into college and were thanking us for helping them through the whole process, while another was returning to main campus for her senior year. And then Andrea summed it up for me perfectly and was like, relationships are the agent of change. We have to build these relationships with these students and have these bonds between us and them and then ideally between them as classmates, but especially for us and they need to trust us and um, that's what I think kind of sums up our successes and leads to our student successes. Okay, Evan's up. I want, um, so Evan's gonna go over um, and speak to staff and curriculum alignment with main campus. Oh, and I wanted to mention too that we started foreign language, our world language, and world language is now a requirement for the class of 23 and, and on and on. So that's been great to add to our staff. Thanks. Hello, good evening everyone. I was uh, originally told this was a Zoom meeting and I said, fine, sounds good. And then I said, you need me where, when? Oh, anyways, uh, so happy to do it. And so just, uh, I understand there was a presentation on this a year or two ago. So just gonna sort of update you a little bit. Now, I think at that presentation, uh, my colleague Bob Stevenson had sort of presented uh, how staffing works, but this slide sort of breaks down um, the current staffing. So you're seeing the social worker and director and special education teacher. We have a full-time mm -hmm. teaching assistant. Um, and then we've actually broken up that 1.2 general ed teacher is broken up across subjects. So this actually allows, I believe it's uh, five teachers from the high school and one from the Sachs Middle School uh, that are specialists in their subjects and certified in their content areas to teach. So go to next slide. Thanks. Do I have to oh, I have a clicker? Oh, that's exciting. Mm -hmm. How about that. So uh, this enables us um, to do a couple, a couple of good things just in terms of curriculum alignment. But there's another slide that talks about the schedule, so I'll hold off that about how it makes things a little bit easier from a programmatic standpoint. Um, so just talking about curriculum, we've tried to focus on experiential learning and project-based learning. Um, but one of the things we've really tried to focus on as well is keeping alignment as much as possible with our core curriculum. So if a student is in ninth grade, uh, we're trying to give them what we call assured experiences, the experiences they would have in ninth grade, uh, regardless of their setting. Uh, this sometimes needs to be tempered uh, based upon that student's background needs, um, individualized educational plan. But just to give you a few examples of how we've tried to align with district curriculum, we've offered a few sort of, doesn't show up necessarily in the transcript, but the experience of certain electives. Last year, I worked with Mr. Stevenson to offer American Studies, which is an interdisciplinary um, English and Social Studies course because we had a large cohort of juniors. We thought that would be a good experience. I'm not sure whether they agree or not, but we tried it. So um, this year I'm offering the senior sort of English electives and working through, I'm, I'm only one man and uh, have never figured out how to be two places at once. So it's a little bit sometimes just running from place to place, but uh, as much as possible, giving the students the chance to uh, have an experience similar to what they would have at main campus, which kind of brings us back to the individualized instruction support. Uh, 
So that works nicely when you have, you know, generally nine through 12 students, you break that down into sort of four cohorts and work with them. But sometimes there's opportunities for overlap in team building overall as a group. This is a little different in math and sciences um, because they're very content rich. So oftentimes they're more like granular dealing with working with students on uh, topics based upon their math competencies or their underlying, um, well, sometimes science is driven by math as well. So certain levels of uh, science wouldn't be, uh, make sense based upon a student if they hadn't had algebra two, for instance. So this kind of brings me down to the third point here, the block scheduling, which was the switch this year at NCHS. Um, if you guys are familiar, we've had a couple schedule changes at the high school recently. Um, that was meant to be a joke. I'm Dr. <laughs> Lutze, like, yeah, I know. I just laugh. I'm like, just to, you know, um, and one of my uh, one of my duties at the high school, I'm also the English department chair, is I uh, work with the, the building administration on setting teacher schedules and trying to balance the um, sections. So the switch to block this year actually uh, fixed it. One of the big issues with trying to uh, share resources in terms of staff with the alternative program or the downtown uh, campus. So that actually will enables that like, most teachers now could be available if they liked to teach at this program. Previously, we had to sort of engineer uh, a block that only worked with certain teacher schedules. It was it was quite difficult. Uh, that was actually I, I'll take credit for it because he's not here. But Mr. Bob Stevenson's fabulous at schedules, and he's like a. It's one of those guys that can do the crossword in ink and doesn't even you know blink. So he helped us a lot with that and would always sit down every summer and sort of work through it. So this summer it got a little bit easier. I'm sort of saying that ironically because it wasn't easy at all because we changed so much. But in the long run, it, it, it may lead to better things for uh, this program. Independent, independent study is something we've offered over the last few years based upon student interest and aptitude. And it sort of spoke to the integration of the main campus. And over the past, we've had many students involved in extracurriculars and clubs. Um, and that's one of the nice things about the schedule being aligned. Just a quick overview of some of the program benefits that Colleen and Andrew have already spoken to. And then I'll jump to the last slide here, which if you see the schedule now, it was very tricky in previous years. So the easier switch in alignment with the block, it makes that possible. And if you see sort of the morning, um, the early morning meeting, uh, is, and it's also called LS, which is learning strategies, that's Colleen's class. This enables for support, but it also allows for us to be compliant with individualized educational plans as needed. So it's, they've been really great at helping us flex because that's in the middle of one of our blocks. So sometimes getting a teacher down there at that time. So that's why that usually works through the morning. And then you can see the core subjects and electives roll through basically the same way they do at this campus. The one trick has been SACS is on a slightly different schedule. Um, so we do, we, it's, ne it's never easy, but we're, we're working through that piece. Okay. You wanna take this one? Yeah, sure. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so just some things looking forward. Um, I think we're always looking to see how we can expand our course offerings for students. Um, to, if students do want to break off and not do kind of, you know, right now our students are in the same class, but if, you know, they are in English 11, English 12, that's split out. But down the road, we would love to be able to offer them more of those electives. Um, we've been working really hard on building relationships in the community um, and are really looking to kind of grow this internship-based program based off the students' passions. Um, so hopefully that, hopefully we'll be able to continue soon. Again, under the circumstances, we're a little limited with that, but working on that. Um, increase the number of students that are um, kind of integrating back and forth between downtown campus and main campus, and also students that are returning to main campus. Because to us, that means that we've, that we've kind of let them fly on their own, um, which is always really exciting to see. Um, and a large focus of ours is our space. So, you know, we are trying to see if kind of there's a way that additional space could help us facilitate being able to expand the program to more students, um, provide more space for kind of small group breakouts, um, do more individual instruction, 
um, kind of the idea of like two classes simultaneously and with more than one content area. Um, and also kind of create more electives in house that even Colleen and I could really help take on. Uh, for example, like if we had a kitchen, we could do a nutrition and wellness class, things like that. Other things that we can kind of provide and break out the group based on what they want. Um, and then more kind of DBT focused groups. So right now, again, with our space, it's hard to really parse some of that out for students. So we really are having to think of kind of from 360 degrees what all the students can use and we can all use a lot of kind of that support, but kind of having more space would allow us to break that out more so we can focus on the kind of the real individual unique needs and get creative with that. Um, anything else in terms of looking forward? Um, and as always, you know, just, we really want to thank kind of, there's one more slide. There was one more slide? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, then. <laughs> thank you for all your support, um, which I was getting to without, I didn't even need the slide to do that. Um, support from administration, all of you, um, the high school staff, um, really our general ed teachers who really help the, our program thrive. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, it's wonderful to see this program thriving, it really is. Um, any questions or comments from the board? Okay. Brendan? Okay. Yeah, I just want to say thank you for the presentation. It's uh, going back to 2017, I guess it was, 2017. Um, you know, seeing this all come together and all the things that you're doing is pretty, uh, pretty impressive. It's great to see. So thank you. Um, I guess my one question is, is there anything that you all have learned um, that you think could be applied at, um, at the high school or at SACS? Um, you know, in maybe in different settings or things that you could um, that you could change here to maybe um, you know make the return to the main campus easier, or maybe um, you know avoid having some kids have to go to the downtown campus. Um, you know, anything along those lines that you've thought through and are implementing. So I think a nice thing about the program is that each of the students remains connected to their school counselor here, as well as their grade level administrator. Even though I function as the administrative liaison, if a student is a sophomore, they're going to stay with the, the sophomore administrator. So I think it, it really is individualized for kids in terms of those transitions. Um, with some, with some students who have come back, it's been a gradual process. So perhaps thinking about one class that they are interested in that perhaps is not available down there and, and let's bring them up here. So we, I mean, it even comes down to, you know, Roy and the transportation group helping out so much with that. Um, systemically, I think the other piece we've really worked on in the last year is thinking about um, making sure we're keeping those lines of communication open. We have a weekly administrative counseling, mental health meeting every Friday that, that Andrea participates in as well. So she can update the, the building-based team on how kids are doing and, and those points of transition. So I think that's maintaining that level of communication is really helpful for that. Great, thank you. Sure. <clears throat> Sherry? Uh, so I just wanna repeat Brendan's kudos. I mean, it's such a powerful and compelling story how you've really helped 20 students, 20 human beings reach their full potential. I mean, it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, my question is, I would, I would think that for at least some or maybe all these students that the pandemic has presented a unique challenge in terms of stress and anxiety. And I'm just curious if you can talk to that, how you've handled that, and again, to Brendan's question, any learnings of how you've handled that, that COVID-19 stress and anxiety that we could transfer to the other schools? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, we all can sit here and say we've definitely felt that, and our, our students have too. Um, they've been very resilient. I'm so proud of, I'm really proud of them. Um, they've um, been able to talk about it openly, and. They do create space for in our space physically. They we do kind of keep the distancing, the masks. We have shields for students that are more comfortable, kind of with the um, plexiglass, and they've all been really respectful. Um, they I think because we also are in our a smaller space essentially that we're not around as many people that also really does help. 
Um, and we do have one student that is fully remote um, because kind of a, a, some of those concerns and some more kind of at risk situations. But our other students, again, have been really resilient and just happy to be back with each other. Uh, so we're following the same protocol that main campus is following. Um, we, do, we, we do talk about it several times a week, just kind of check in or when things are happening. I know a lot of students have come back to main campus. Um, so we, when those transitions are happening here, we're always making sure that we're talking about it with our students as well. And we did come. We did have every, we did offer people to come back sooner once we had the space ready. Yeah. And, um, and so we did the two cohorts and then we, we had everyone back as like the same time that elementary did. Can I actually just offer, I just wanna mm -hmm. also say like, to just give you guys credit, Colleen and Andrew, cause it, it was a struggle initially, distance learning, especially with this particular group of students, they're, um, they're sort of, mar they feel on the, on the margins to begin with. So Zoom, uh, hybrid instruction, we were struggling the first two weeks. So we kind of pivoted and, and because of the flexibility program, we were able to make that um, and bring them back and still be within district guidelines about social distancing, classroom size. Um, so that's the nice piece about the flexibility here. To your question, could we apply, how do we apply those things? Um, it's tricky because it's a smaller group and we have that flexibility. We're talking about an institution with was it about 1,300 students like this one, a little harder to pivot on a dime. So I wish I had a, <laughs> I wish I had a nugget of wisdom I could share beyond that, but that we found that once they were back in in-person learning, um, a lot better things were starting to happen. Not to say uh, distance learning doesn't work for everyone, but it seems to be a, a particular type of student from my perspective. And strangely enough, our attendance has been better this year than, than the other two years. Yeah, Isn't true. that funny? I didn't think about that. Okay, Carl. I, I had just a question on how the instructional piece works. So when it comes to the like English block, is there a single instructor teaching across great grade levels? Mm -hmm. so, so it's not like a regular class where the teacher's there with 20 people must be much more one-on-one. -on -one. You could just talk about that. And in particular math too, where students may be at different levels too. Yeah, I think, I mean, Evan can speak to it, but each teacher is teaching at least two levels. So math, like science, for example, is doing an anatomy physiology class for the seniors and a biology class for the sophomores. And some of the work can overlap. And then some, and then some is differentiated for each group. Yeah, that's so for uh, in English classroom right now, I, ha I have uh, two levels of students, so seniors, and they're working. I'm working with them on one particular thing. And then I have uh, a group of sophomores. I'm working with them on um, a, uh, a different project. Uh, it's more reading based. So, yeah, I mean, sort of I mean, smaller group sort of enables that. But you do some planning. You do have a t teaching assistant there that can coach them through. So it's a little. Um, I, a little like the one room schoolhouse model, I, I guess, in some sense. Yeah, exactly. But when you have a small group, it's, it's possible. I mean, there, like I said, there are some days where I feel like, wait, wait, okay, I need to check in with this person. Um, but yeah, that's usually how it works. When it gets to, when you get to like a larger group, you have four grade levels, usually the way I've dealt with in the past is I start lumping them together and I can always scale. Like English is uh, an easier subject to differentiate for because I can always scale like reading assignments based upon reading levels. A little harder when you get to math and science, sort of more like kind of technical and scaled. Thank you very much, to, you know, for all the <clears throat> teachers that volunteer to do this work. It's really incredible. Yeah, I I would like to second that. Uh, we've been really fortunate in that the majority of the teachers in the program for the first three years have been our department chairs, so they certainly have the broadest understanding of the scope and sequence of you know who is entering as a ninth grader and what do they need to do and where do we want to get them by, by 12th grade. And that's been a huge benefit uh, to us. It also, in the early days, because their schedules were a little different than a teacher who might be teaching a full load, um, it made it easier for them to become the teachers down there. But as Evan said, one of the things I think as we go forward is looking at building the ability and the sustainability so that other people can step into these roles as they're interested as well. Penny, go ahead. 
So I, again, this is a fabulous program and it's providing service for these students that we didn't previously have in the district, which I think is, is tremendous. One of the things I would be interested in hearing in the future uh, is what, how well do our students who go on to college and go on to their college, uh, go on to do jobs, how do they do? Do they stay in college? Do they graduate from college? Have we provided enough of that foundation um, that they're successful? Uh, and I was also wondering what um, you thought the optimal size for the alternative, the downtown campus would be. Yeah, I mean, in terms of school, we have students now that are kind of midway through. So then they've been really successful, um, which has been nice. Um, were you gonna say something? Nope, go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, in terms of size, I think, you know, it's something we have to be really thoughtful about because I think one of the great parts of this program is that students can come to us and feel like it is a really safe space for them. That being said, I mean, I, I think, you know, 15, 20 students, I think, could really be manageable and work well and really, I think, round out the program in a lot of ways. Um, and I know that just from a lot of other districts, that's kind of also kind of what they're looking at, too, in terms of their enrollment. So now I will speak and just say okay. that um, when we built the staffing model, that was the plan that we, yeah. to start smaller and be able to flex up to about that 15 to 18, maybe 20 mm -hmm. students. You wouldn't want to go over that um, because of the interpersonal dynamics that occur and everything else. But that's a good, a good number with the amount of staff and support that we have to, to keep those personal connections. So now it's just a question of space. Jen, and Sorry. Well, th thank you so much. The work you guys have done and just to watch this program as it's grown is really incredible. So thank you so much. I was actually going to ask um, more about the size. Like I know you in your um, looking forward piece, you're asking for additional space. So currently you said you, how many students are in the program right now? So there's eight students, um, but six are on campus with us right now. Right. Um, I would say eight, like under um, this. Well, right. Anyway. Um, and then... Last year and previous years, we've capped at 10. Under the circumstances with COVID, I mean, we're pretty much at our max in our space. Right. And do we ever, um, like, I know space is an issue, and, and clearly this would be incredible if we could, you know, help grow the program a little bit. Do we turn ever turn children, I mean, do we turn kids away that could potentially benefit from this program because of size? Yeah, I mean, we have had people like that have inqu inquired in terms of where we are and when we do meet our limit. I mean, the guidance and other clinical staff have been kind of really thoughtful in terms of knowing where where we are with that. So they know that if we're kind of at that eight to ten range, that they might not, you know, they might hold off until we have students we have students that graduate or students that might transition back. So yes, there is interest outside of the students that are with us. Um, we've just been able to kind of work around it a little. Yeah, but an important thing you just said is yeah. we're not turning students away. Right. I mean, that's part of the connection between the program and the high school, your participation in the SAM meetings on right. Friday mornings. Right. The counselors all know, and it would all go through the counselors. So that, you know, we're not, we wouldn't turn students away, right. but we wouldn't make the opportunity available unless there was a place for them to go. Right, exactly. But if potentially we had more space, potentially yeah. we could. I, yeah, if we had more space, we'd have a larger program. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There are, or we have somebody who was just talked about last week about mm -hmm. going over there but and normally we would have room but this year we're trying to cap it at, at eight and even with the the number we have there are times where the students come into the office suite and use the conference room just to make sure that we're maintaining the space right. um yeah so if we had you know the, the increase in the space the opportunity there it's one of those if you build it they will come right right <laughs> well thank you so much julie did you have a comment okay great i was my question too so <laughs> glad we are all thinking alike um okay Thing with that. Thank you very much. Thank Excellent you. presentation. I just want to very quickly say thank you also. You know, my when I started teaching, my first uh, year or so was in an alternative program. And I truly believe to this day I'm, I'm a better teacher and uh, educator because of my time in, in the alternative program and learning to meet kids where they are and work with them. And it can be exhausting work, and, and uh, but it definitely is a labor of love. And our kids are so fortunate to have all of you committed to this and seeing this through. And it's it's inspiring to see a program that started as an idea and now is, is truly doing what we intended, which is shaping kids' lives. So, thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Next on our agenda is a facilities update with Mr. Clark, and we'll give him a minute here to make the transition.
Good evening, everyone. Nice to see you all. Tonight's presentation, there's two bullet points on the uh, menu here, response to COVID-19, and we'll also give you a facilities uh, capital and maintenance project update for the current year 2021, and then we're also going to give you a preview for 21-22, what we're planning on. And I keep saying we because my assistant manager, Scott Olson, was supposed to be here too, but we'll get him, we'll get him at the next meeting. Scott was very instrumental in us having the success that we've had over the course of the last few months leading the teams um, to get the work done. So in response to COVID-19, well, it all all about the cleaning. And the first thing we had to do was really find out what the scope of the work was. We had to develop the protocol based on the guidelines. We had to select and acquire the disinfectant products, the application tools for these products, and the PPE, the personal protective equipment. We also then went to develop a disinfecting schedule and identify the staffing requirements based on these protocols and the disinfecting schedule. We also realized that we had to increase the staff to be able to meet the demands of this work that was out there um, that was required. So we hired four full-time equivalents uh, through June 30th of 21, and their station, one is at Saks, one is at uh, the high school, and then we have two floaters. And we also modified the work orders to include one extra hour per day per employee at the elementary school. Again, all to meet the guidelines and all of our schedules that we created. On the maintenance end of things, with our mechanics and our in-house people that we have, our electricians and carpenters, well, they played a big part in protecting the students and the staff with uh, acrylic shields. We purchased the four by eight sheets of uh, acrylic material ourselves. We uh, went down into, we have a, lot, um, a shop in the high school that uh, is used for students when we use it in the summer. But this allowed us access to great equipment, table saws and so forth, that we were able to fabricate desk, cafeteria and reception area acrylic shields. And uh, I have some pictures to show you that uh, shortly. Uh, we also increased the ventilation capacity. We know that was a very big part of the response and uh, able to keep the school safe and well ventilated. Uh, we uh, upgraded our energy management software that we have for all five schools uh, and actually went through an, a commissioning process with the vendor to make sure that every point, every piece of equipment out in the field uh, is communicating with the computer. So we were very confident that when we would issue a command or create a schedule to ventilate the buildings, that the work was being done properly and accurately. And of course, we did a, a quite a few uh, in-person uh, visits to all the equipment when we did that. So we could have one person at the computer, one person at the equipment just to verify that it was very important for us. The other thing we did to increase the ventilation capacity was um, in the three elementary schools in Sachs, we installed over 300 window fans, which included us having to run the power to the fans and also put plexiglass on the window so when the windows were open, um, the fan would fit into it and we'd make sure that we keep uh, bugs out and so forth, and things like that. Again, all this work was done with our in-house people. We also un installed sanitation stations and you may have seen them at the entrances to the schools. As soon as people come into the school, that's the first thing that uh, we ask people to do is to use the sanitation and wash their hands. Uh, we also installed signage outside the, the building so when people would come up to the doors they'd see the sign reminding people about the upcoming sanitation station but also to wear masks and also to maintain the six foot social distance spacing. We also re relocated classroom contents to storage containers. We have two storage containers at each school so we, we brought the um, the furniture out there for storage. And then for new equipment and anything that we would buy, the, uh, the cleaning products and materials and so forth, uh, the SAC school was our central warehouse so that we could receive all the deliveries, um, inventorize them and, and carefully and accurately distribute them to the schools. So here's a picture of the high school cafeteria. This is one example of the plexi work that we did, the acrylic. Uh, there's 26 tables in there that um, needed to have the fabrication uh, plexi installed. And what's interesting is, of course, these tables fold up in the middle so that they can be rolled away after they're cleaned. 
and um, then the floors can be cleaned. So we designed the plexiglass to be able to bend with that. We don't have to take the plexiglass off of the table. We have clips there that secure them safely and securely. And this way it saves time for the custodians instead of having to dismantle all that every night when we had the, or actually during the day as well when we clean the tables. So that's an example of some of the work that we did in house. I mentioned the signs. There's uh, a couple of examples of the signs as you come into the uh, West School main entrance. And then when you get into the lobby, there it is, is the uh, sanitation station. And then an example of the nurse's office, you can see that we have uh, the plexi there with a slot there so that the nurse can just accept paper um, without any patient coming around into the nursing area unless they need to do that. And then our flower tables, here's an example of uh, two pieces of uh, plexiglass which were cut and formed and installed to be able to allow four children to sit at the table at a safe distance. Um, I can tell you that there were several thousand cuts that had to be made uh, for, e for all of the uh, plexi that we installed. Uh, just to give you some perspective, um, the, the amount of work that was done, but again, it was all designed uh, installed and maintained by our, our maintenance people and cleaned, of course, by our custodians. So I'll give you an update on some of the capital and maintenance projects we've been working on as well. So at, five, at four schools, we had masonry restoration and repair. We took advantage of the access to the outside of the schools and uh, went through all the buildings on the outside, uh, prioritizing repairs that need to be made, replace brick, uh, rake out and replace roofs, uh, loose mortar. We have prefabricated concrete uh, beams that we recoded. We had EFIS, which in the old days they used to call it uh, stucco, uh, which is the feature that's on three of the schools. So we took advantage of that to complete all that work. Uh, we also completed the, the uh, new roof replacement at uh, eSchool. I have a picture of that coming up. Um, also remediate water incursion. The first uh, project that we targeted was the East Playground. Uh, the water would shed off of the gym, flow across the parking lot and just dump into the playground and make, making it unusable for the kids. Uh, so we dug that all up, installed a new drain system with the help of the town and uh, we collected all the water from the, the gym now. That's also piped in that so it's, uh, that was one uh, that was very successful. In the meantime, we have uh, water uh, monitoring wells installed all around the school so we can uh, measure to see if we have any water collecting around the building so we can help evaluate the need for any drainage that we need to just to be able to keep the building dry. Uh, when the ability, when the, uh, the spaces are available, we want to resume our painting program and the same thing with uh, carpeting, uh, replacing the carpet in the media center. There's a picture of our east roof, solar. I know the last time I showed you some pictures that look quite different than what you see here. Um, but what, if you also notice in the middle, uh, it's uh, all full of solar panels. So the solar panels, uh, the teams are still there. We're looking to finish them up between two and three weeks from now. So uh, we'll keep you updated on that too. But the roof is 100% complete and um, performing very well. There's another picture of what I described earlier, the EFIS, that tan material that circulates around the, the building and then it's supported by the precast concrete. That was all cleaned up and recoded, as well as have all the bricks repointed. So over the years you've heard us talk about that when there's projects that are uh, really should be coordinated and budgeted together. Um, this is another example of that when it's time to replace the roof, we also needed to address the structural features too. And uh, part of it was for structural integrity, uh, but also for the aesthetics of the building, to keep the building dry and tight as well. It all, it all goes together. South School resurfaced the kindergarten playground, and, and uh, I have to say thank you to Tiger Mann and Ro, uh, uh, Mo Sacri uh, for helping us with that. They did a great job resurfacing that playground. Uh, again, we had uh, more restoration of brickwork. Uh, around the building and then when the space becomes available we'll, we'll resume our painting and uh, carpet in the media center and we have an expansion joint and uh, a tile floor that needs to be replaced. And there's a picture of the playground 
that was resurfaced. They are also nice enough to come back and, and take care of all the games. Now you can see Foursquare there um, and some of the other paintings that were in the, in the asphalt. Here's West School. Replaced the oil tank that was on the, uh, the budget. We didn't replace it, but what we did was have it officially closed. I think uh, you may know, and we may have spoken about this before, that the state wouldn't allow us to use this oil tank. They gave us a one-year extension. And um, it, we're still holding out hope that gas may come up to our school next summer. So we have a replacement. We have a temporary t uh, oil tank up there right now to be able to, uh, again, ride out for another year. And then we can make a decision if, if the gas comes or if it doesn't come, what we, what we need to do. Uh, again, masonry restoration of the brick. And when I talk about this, the first thing that they do is they come and they power wash all the buildings. So we get clean buildings, and then they go and uh, restore, do the restoration work. Uh, in this case, it also included rebuilding the chimney um, up on the roof of the school. We also completed the replacement of the stage floor and the uh, cafetorium. And then again, painting, replaced the PE wall mats, the, the safety mats in the, in the gym, and carpeting in the school psychiatry's office, uh, pending the availability into the space. And there's a picture of the west stage floor. SACS facilities update. Again, masonry restoration. Uh, we replaced the cafeteria roof to get it prepared for a solar project that we uh, are planning on, and that's still in the planning stages. We hope to close that out soon. Um, so we can take advantage of the weather. A cogeneration plant, we have the CHP in design right now, uh, combined heat and power unit to save uh, electricity, but also uh, provide electricity by uh, making it with gas. So we'll, we'll talk more about that in detail as, uh, as the design progresses. Uh, we are out to bid to replace a boiler. We have three boilers in the school. One of them needs to be, is at the top of the list, uh, just in terms of replacement. Uh, we have two others that will carry the, the load in the meantime, but we're also looking to replace them as well. So on the bid, we have uh, two phases, phase one and phase two, uh, so we can get pricing um, for both phases. And then energy conservation, LED lighting, as we're going through and identifying the uh, measures for that, that's pending. So painting, we have floor tile repair, replace parking lot fixtures, and install a walkway in the inner circle, which uh, people walk across the grass from the traffic light when you, if you come from the high school side. And we want to provide a better walking surface there. So when we're able to get out to that space when it's available, uh, we're going to address these projects. There's a, uh, a view of the roof. You can see those, uh, the circular, they're actually metal uh, snow buster, so when the snow slides right and down, it, it uh, divides it up. So it doesn't uh, come down in big sheets. And for the high school, well, another great job done by Tiger Man and his crew, uh, paving the parking lot here in the front of the school, uh, all around to the back, the bar parking lot, all the way down through uh, athletics. So really appreciate their support with that. Uh, masonry restoration, it's ongoing. Um, energy uh, conservation, the LED lighting, that's pending the identification of all the measures. Uh, the auditorium lighting, there's been uh, some meetings already that we've attended with uh, the auditorium people and a vendor to look at the uh, opportunities out there and what options are, are there. That's been approved through the budget already. And again, pending availability of the interior space. Uh, we'll address the carpeting and the guidance and the main office areas. Uh, same thing with painting. We'll continue our painting plan. Uh, we have common uh, flooring issues in common areas that need to be replaced, uh, specifically even 119 and 120, and then um, also in the uh, replace the flooring in consumer science. And there's a picture of the... Uh, of the paving at the high school. We did all the restriping as well, so it's a first class job. So for 21 22, a preview, um, ongoing floor replacements, this time in E School. Um, after we address the boilers in uh, SACS, the next priority would be for the South School boilers. Uh, West, um, 
we're hoping that we finish everything we need to do with the, the oil tanks there um, so that then we can go ahead and replace the, uh, the parking lot repavement. It's going to have to be all just torn up and just completely replace that, that whole drive from the driveway from the road all the way out to the back. And uh, flooring replacements uh, as well. We have some old tile there that, that uh, needs to be replaced. And the roof. Now the roof was uh, scheduled to come up to th uh, this year, but uh, we have a pretty good handle on the repairs now, and we feel that we can defer that for another year or two. We can evaluate it as time goes on. Uh, we have another uh, priority that, that uh, we need to focus in terms of roofs. Uh, I'll get that in a second. So at Sachs, parking lot uh, repavement. Uh, we're also looking at the gym floor replacement, just as we did with the high school, where we sanded down the gym floor. Uh, we need one this year, maybe one next year, um, but to sand it down and recode it. And then masonry repairs. We still have some repairs that we need to address um, in the uh, courtyard areas and so forth. So the roof replacement uh, for the high school is also something that we'd like to start uh, looking at. and. Um, Start the, start the projects, actually. Uh, we, we need to accelerate that uh, because of the age and the conditions of the, of the roofs. And uh, we, we really think it's a good idea that, to get that up on the uh, priority schedule for the roof replacements. And also combined heat and power, uh, similar to what we're adding in the, um, at the uh, middle school, but to be able to create our own ability with natural gas to be able to uh, create power to reduce that, but also to um, heat our schools with uh, more efficient equipment. And then district-wide, um, it's technology. It's uh, ongoing SV, SUV uh, sped vans and uh, painting in, in all the schools inside and out. Questions? Thank you, Dan. Uh, questions, anyone? Brendan? Um, thank you. I have, I think I have two questions, uh, but first one comment, which is these pictures of the plexiglass are amazing. Um, the work that was done is just, I mean, you can tell how high quality it is. And I think I'm sure for the kids and the, the teachers and staff, um, not having, you know, big frames around the plexiglass makes a huge difference. I mean, you can't even tell that they're here. So um, I want to commend you and the, the team on getting all that done. Um, and then uh, my questions were um, first on the natural gas at West. Um, do we have any, have we had any more conversations or has the town around making that happen? No? Not that I'm aware of recently. Yeah. I don't know. If so we get a, a monthly update or the advisory committee for the town. It's Board of Selectmen. Uh, Tiger does provide them with an update. But there's nothing committed as I know of um, right now. Penny might have something more to add to that. Um, and then my second question was, could you just remind us how old the Buchanan High School roof is, the high school roof is? Well, there's uh, the, uh, the youngest roof was finished in 2007 uh, with the, all the construction. But the last time the roof, the existing building was replaced was uh, 1999. Thank you. Julie? I'm just wondering about the LED conservation lighting. Um, can you just explain a little bit about what that is in the, in the two schools and then just wondering, has, it, has that been done in the elementary schools or is there a, a plan to do that in, their, in those schools? Yes, through cooperation with the, uh, the power company at the time, we, um, we did put a project together and replaced all the lights in all three elementary schools okay. uh, with LED. And that also included the emergency lights and exit signs and things like that. So there's, there's a replacement for everything. We also did the exterior uh, parking lot lights too. So they're all on LEDs now as well. So since then we hired an electrician who uh, has a lot of experience with this type of work. Uh, had, actually had his own company for a long time. So uh, right now we're going in the identification phases. Most of the lights that are in the school now are typical fluorescent fixtures. So, um, and there's also a lot of accent lighting that was installed when we did the renovations back in the 90s, particularly the library and, some, and the cafeteria. So we've been going through there and identifying what the fixtures are now 
the light bulbs and the commensurate replacement that the power company will give you an incentive a rebate for. There's a few different ways to access these funds, but um, some of it, they bundle it with larger projects. And we're trying to take the best course so that we can maximize what kind of return we get, also with the savings, but what kind of incentive we get with the time. How long does that take? You know, and, um, I, and I think it's a good time for the high school and the middle school now because all the light bulbs are starting to wear and burn out. So rather than invest the money just putting the same light bulbs back in there, we want to be able to channel that to the replacements. So we're in the planning for that right now. And then we'll meet with the power company to see what kind of incentives. Again, there's a lot of different programs. We've got to figure out which is the best fit for us. And, uh, and hopefully, if not a majority of it, but at least some of the work we want to be able to do in-house with the staff that we have. So, okay, thank you. John? So I just want to reiterate uh, what Brendan said. I mean, it, just looking at these pictures and hearing, I mean, I can't even imagine how much work went into getting these schools ready for these, everyone to come back. So thank you so much to everyone. Um, and I just had a quick question about the, the cleaning. I know, again, you guys, I mean, the, the change between last year and this year is probably just incredible. Do you feel like we have enough staff to be able to keep up with the cleaning and like, you know, in all of our schools? Do we... I mean, how is your staff handling it? And Because I'm sure it's just an incredible amount of work. I, I think with the staffing model that we have now, especially because we've been into it for a few months and we've, we've been able to really become efficient, uh, we're able to keep up with it. I think the, the guys do an excellent job uh, every day. And that's really what it is. Mm -hmm. It's all about being very diligent. And, um, and they are. And so we do inspections and, and um, you know, we make sure that all this, the, uh, and that's why we're, we have floaters as well. Mm -hmm. So that if we have somebody out, or, right. uh, you know, we can plug them back in just to make sure we're consistent. Right. Well, thank you very much. It is something we have to continually watch, um, as Dan's saying, because if, you know, for instance, if a, a couple of custodians are out and, you know, we have the floaters now, but if we were to not have enough staff to do that, you know, that it's mission critical to clean and disinfect the schools every night. So we have to make sure that gets done. And the model's working now, but we have to keep an eye on it and make sure it continues to, just, just to be fair. Mm -hmm. uh, Carl? What's the, what's the size of the force of the crew with the four additions? What's the total? With, with oh, the, the number of custodians and maintenance people? Yeah. Uh, I believe it's 41. 41, okay. So it's like a 10% Actually, increase, like we have, with well, the, it's with the additions now. It's, with the additions, it's 41. Yeah. Our normal staffing model is 36 to 37, depending on you know uh, attrition. Thanks. Bob. All right. Thanks for this. Um, can you expand on what what the the bullet technology is? What does that mean? Uh, that's uh, more on the IT side. Huh. So each year we do have a $600,000 spend that we lease over a four-year period. So we replenish it every four years with 600,000. It's been in the budget for as long as I've been here, probably six or seven years, I would guess, right now. Right, so that's here as a capital item preview, but not for a facilities capital item preview. Right, just that's because it's yeah. Yep. Although the technology that's included in facilities now and the well, way that the wondering. builders communicate like, to each other and everything, there's quite a bit there's there. A, there's a lot of building intelligence, right, or mm -hmm. systems for buildings now. So I think yeah, and having them all talk to each other and the central management systems and all. So that's been another initiative over the last few years that we've undertaken and will continue. I'll just, um, oh, Bob, did you have another question? Nope. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I just want to add a comment as well about, you know, just the innovation and the hard work that's gone into keeping opening our schools. I mean, it's large in part why we were able to open to all of our students. Um, I know the acrylic shields are, it's an amazing story how you bought the shield. And I know we, we saved a lot of money for the district and the custom, thoughtful, innovative solutions that you've implemented throughout the schools. I enjoy seeing the pictures that come through in the newsletters and how the kids are still able to interact and have science labs and work together uh, face to face with the, with the plexiglass in a safe way. So. I just appreciate that. And then also, I know the ventilation is a huge, uh, it was a huge part of the mm -hmm. guidelines from the state. And so I appreciate a lot, a lot of the work and thoughtful, um, innovative solutions that have been put into place as well. So it's, it's pretty incredible. My, my only question is, are, 
I know you had um, pending availability of interior space, and I wasn't, are any of those related specifically to COVID and using spaces that we normally don't use the way that we're using them, or is, are those just things that are still scheduled to be, to be um, completed later in the school year or in the summer? Yeah, it's, it's more really just talking about vacation time and right. other times when we have access, we can come in and, okay. know, that, that vacations mostly. Great. Right. Oh. Sure, Carl. I'm just curious, because Dr. Keating has mentioned this too. What, what was the what, what kind of stuff came out of the classrooms, by and large, that you know are stored now in the um, in the uh, storage facilities? Well, we needed to maintain social distance. We needed to design the rooms to be able to safely, um, but we also needed to make sure that the the, um, the room had what it needed to be able to provide that. Um, really, what we would do, we we would go to the staff and ask, you see you have this bookcase here, are you using it because you need it or it's here so you're mm -hmm. using it? So it's those kind of questions so mm -hmm. that, you know, we tried to involve them so that we didn't take away from the educational experience, but we did what we really needed to do to make sure that we maintain the social distance, so. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for the update. And just to comment on what you said, um, you know, we, we did, and we continue to really have our eyes open. We do look really closely at everything in the staff. Um, but to be able to get here tonight to talk to you about this is because we have such great re leadership. We really mean that. So it really, it makes us feel really good when we can you know, do the work that really we know that needs to be done and have the resources to be able to do it properly. So um, thank you for us too, for all of that, for all of you too. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Next is a statement of accounts, Dr. Keating. Okay, before we start, I would like to thank Mr. Clark and his team as well. Mm -hmm. They've been amazing. They're always amazing, they always have been, but this year they just made it happen for us and I'm so proud of them and so thankful for them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we have the statement of accounts uh, before you tonight through September 30th. Uh, so just to let you know, the you know we're 10% through the school year, 25% through the fiscal year. To date, we spent 14.6% of our budget, encumbered 73%, and most of that is 75% uh, of that is salaries, and we have 12.4% of our budget remaining. I wanted to point out to you that in the far um, left-hand column, the numbers from last year at this point in time. We had spent 15466813 And if you compare it to what we've spent this year, there's a difference of $2.2 .2 million. And I wanted to um, explain to you why that is. Last year in the month of September, we paid 50% of our uh, bill to DATCO, which we pay in two installments. It's $1.6 million. This year, we, that transaction was not processed until the beginning of October. In addition to that, the reduction in the internal services fund uh, for a three month period based on the budget, and that just basically goes over based on what's approved in the budget, is a reduction of 625,000. So between those two numbers, those are the main drivers for that difference, if somebody asks you. There's pluses and minuses here and there throughout, but the rest of the accounts are fairly stable. I also wanted to direct you um, to pages uh, six and seven in the back of the report. This is a document that we provided to the Board of Finance the, um, last week where we discussed all of our expenditures to date and our needs in terms of an additional special appropriation. And I wanted to mention to you that um, I provided them with more detail than I have to the Board in the past as was requested from the Board of Finance. And it's detailed um, in categories, the same categories we've reported out in the past, the PPE, technology, instructional cleaning, we've added transportation. I believe we talked about that at our last meeting and other. <coughs> uh, there's a lot of detail be behind all of these numbers as we purchase many, many things. So if you can imagine PPE, the thousands and thousands of masks that we've purchased for both st uh, the adults and the students, the shields, um, all the acrylic that we've purchased. So there's a lot of detail behind the numbers, which we certainly have in our records, because that's how we procure things, is through detail. 
Um, and we have put together some information that we will share with Board of Finance members that are interested to know about those kind of things. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to give them a comfort level that we certainly have done our homework, uh, which we do. We have a procurement coordinator that works in the business office who is very, very good. She's excellent. She knows her um, craft and she does do a lot of competitive quoting, searching through state bids, um, national bids, regional bids. And I do believe, uh, you know, I've looked over it again after last week that uh, we have really at, the, at any given time, you know, you have to take into consideration back in June, there wasn't a lot of PPE available for schools. But at that time, uh, we have all the pricing we received and we certainly can share that information with those that are interested in knowing about it. But at the end of the day, we're $1,943,091 um, expended through the end of September. Uh, we had a $400 uh, amount of money that the uh, town did put aside for us in the non-lapsing account. The Board of Finance did approve $1,543,91 to move forward to Town Council, and we will be meeting with them on Wednesday to discuss this, and we'll go into the detail, as much detail as we need to with them as well. I will say that through uh, the remainder of this year, we're going to have replenishing expenses, and of course the heating se uh, season is something that we need to determine, you know, see what happens with that, as the ventilation Dan has just spoke about um, is much more, um, it's, it's really, uh, we're turning over the air more frequently, a lot more frequently than we had in the past, which means the heat's gonna be going out the doors and the windows and the vents. So um, we're gonna watch that very closely and we'll report out to the board on a monthly basis as to what those expenditures look like. Thank you for the update. Questions? Oh, Carl. No, they're not. They're in a separate fund, and that's how um, it, you know Lunda chose to do it, which is fine. I think that's the better way to handle it, and it will be completely audited, like our annual audit is of all of our other expenditures, for you know appropriateness, coding, you know, and so forth. So that'll be part of the annual audit. All right. Uh, so moving on to our act, thank you, Dr. Keating. Moving on to our action items uh, is our first is our um, board of eating board of education meeting schedule for 2021. Um, so we'll go ahead and make a motion and then discuss it. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Motion to approve. Sherry, second. Carl. All right. Discussion. Yep. Just very. Um quickly, briefly, and we can speak about it more at the next meeting if you like, because it is something we approve over two, two readings. Um, in January, we're asked to give the calendar to the town of our regular meeting dates. So this establishes these dates as the, the evenings for the regular meetings. Uh, they, can, they can be canceled, but uh, if need be, but after it's been submitted, a new meeting then becomes a special meeting. And the difference there is simply that in a special meeting, you can't modify the agenda at the meeting itself. It has to be set and posted and then things can't change. So it just, you lose a little bit of flexibility. So if you just quickly look through, you see a couple in July. Uh, we've done that in the past and sometimes we've canceled one of the meetings in July, you know, as we've gone through. And then the other, um, another piece to it was in September. Typically we have a meeting on the Tuesday in September after Labor Day, but this year Rosh Hashanah is the Tuesday after Labor Day. So then we'd, we'd I figured we'd just keep going, just do it on Wednesday instead, because that is the nice back to school meeting where we have an opportunity to talk. So um, I'll be quiet and take a look, and we can modify this if you have any suggestions or thoughts for uh, next meeting okay. prior to approval. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, next up is the approval of our PPA and authoriza authorization of execution for the solar power purchase agreement. Dr. Keating? Well, there are two steps to this. Okay. Um, yeah. There are two motions, if you see one yeah. on the front and another on the back. The one on the front is to actually amend the motion that the Board of Ed approved in April, on April 6th. Because if, if you'll recall, back in April, we, um, we went through the PP, PPA, talked in quite a bit of conversation about all that. And then the Board of Ed approved the uh, execution of the power purchase agreement with um, Davis Hill for West, for Sachs, and for East. 
And then after that, that meeting, we went and spoke with the Board of Selectmen and the first Selectman who uh, asked to, to do things a little bit differently, try to bundle things together. And long story short, the, um, that motion, since it was voted and approved, our first motion would be to amend that motion and to rescind the approval for West and for Sachs. And then the next one, the next motion would be to then authorize superintendent to execute an agreement with the new company we're going to use, who is um, Plankton Energy. Mm -hmm. That's been vetted through that. And Joanne has details, and I know Penny, as a member of the Selectman's Advisory Committee, has some details too, if you like. Okay. So that's why there are two different motions for the same thing. Okay. So we'll make the first motion to amend the, um, amend the motion of the Board of Education of April 6, 2020, is hereby so that approval and or execution of the power purchase agreement by and between the New Canaan Public Schools and Davis Hill Development is not authorized for West Elementary School and Sachs Middle School. First, Penny. Second, Bob. We, okay. um, could I just ask a question? Sure. Um, so could we just get, you know, maybe some of an update on Sachs and West and where that stands? I don't know, Penny, if you want to do that or what else? Uh, so I'll start again. To work with the town, we rebid it. The town had a lot of uh, other buildings, some smaller buildings, and it was thought that if we could bundle it all together, we could get more attractive pricing for everyone. So we went through the process, um, and then we vetted the bidders. Uh, we liked Plankton originally. Uh, we worked with another bidder that was a little bit uh, lower for a time, and then it turned out that we did not have a meeting of the minds. So um, we moved on to Plankton for the buildings. Uh, we think they'll be a very good uh, contractor. Uh, Joanne has done an excellent job vetting them and working with them. And so I, I fully recommend that we go forward with this plan. Okay, great. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. And, and did, uh, did Davis Hill stay involved in the bidding as well, or did they? Davis Hill did stay involved with the bidding, and the town is looking at, I don't know, it, we didn't determine that they were the best uh, for, uh, in terms of price for West and Sachs, but they're very competitive for the town. So I don't want to speak as to what the town's going to do for their buildings. They did, uh, and they did South and East. Yes, basically. yes, they're yeah. excellent contractors. Yeah. Sorry, okay. just, no. just to follow up again. Is, so as it turns out, the Sachs and West projects are going to be separate from whatever the town is doing? Is that right? The, the way that we it was bid out was yeah. to give the the, uh, school, uh, the schools and the towns ultimate flexibility. It was bid by project, so um, that was so the rates varied depending upon what the project was. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And, and did it work we're required out? Did to bundling them together actually end up creating savings or no? Like, and how does the pricing this revised pricing compare to? the Davis Hill pricing that we looked at uh, previously. I will let our CFO answer that <laughs> one. It is more competitive than what we had with Davis Hill. Um, so for example, at West, uh, Davis Hill's price was 0 0.053, so five, cent, five cents and three tenths. Uh, Plankton is at 3.85 cents, mm. so it's better. At Sachs, um, Davis Hill was 5.5 .5 cents, and Plankton is 3.48. So the pricing's better. And we vetted them out, and they are a qualified bidder. We felt very good about the quality of their installer. Their uh, references panned out very nicely, and we feel like we ha will have a good partnership with them. Um, at the same time, the town went out with a number of different buildings, and it looks like right now Davis Hill is their low bidder. So um, I told them they have a great contractor to work with. You know? <laughs> But that's it, that's how it worked out. All right. Uh, so second motion to approve did, the. Yep. Did we vote on the first one? No. Oh no. Sorry. So all in favor of the first motion. Okay. Motion to approve the power purchase agreement between the New Canaan Public Schools and Plankton Energy for West Elementary School at 3.85 cents per kilowatt hour and Sachs Middle Sachs Middle School at 3.48 cents per kilowatt hour and authorize the superintendent to execute the contracts. Motion, Penny, second, Jen, all in favor? Great, all right. It's nice to see
see that moving forward. Thank you. All right. Uh, comments from the public? Checking to see if anything's been submitted. <laughs> Bill's going to take a walk. Mr. Tesber will stretch his legs. Yep. yep. <laughs> okay. None, thank you. Uh, finally, announcements and future business. Dr. Letzi. Sure, just a couple of brief things. One is um, we are revisiting the option for remote participation for Board of Ed members unable to physically attend. So we'll be um, having more conversation about that and uh, working. We have the one of the items on the expense sheet that you'll see is the um, clear one speaker system. And so we had one here that we were uh, working with to see how we could get it set up for our board meetings to make that work for folks who, you know, for whatever, maybe you have to quarantine or other things to try to continue um, encouraging everyone. Um, so we'll work on that and have that ready for next meeting. Uh, I did want to share that um, since we began bringing our students back from um, the hybrid to coming back into full-time learning. Uh, we had anticipated that some that were fully remote would come off of fully remote and, and participate. And we had anticipated that because we've seen it happen uh, in Europe often where uh, students, uh, families initially chose remote, but once the trust was built, they decided to come back in. So a snapshot today, if we go back to September 17th to here we are, October 19th, um, We've gone, we've had 53 students opt out of remote to come back to school, you know, full time with us, which is close to 20% uh, of those that had chosen remote. And I think that's a really strong indicator of the, of the good work we're doing, of the good, what Dan and his crew are doing, all of the, you know, all the work that everyone is putting in uh, to build that confidence in our schools. So we've gone from 281 to 228 uh, over that, those couple of weeks. And that's, since we started bringing them back, which is nice. Uh, other than that, you know, we are continuing on, as, as Joanne mentioned, we'll be at the town council on Wednesday night to talk to them about the, uh, the request for the additional funds and, uh, and keep doing our work. The staffing model that we have is working well with our uh, substitute teachers being able to fill in when we do have positive cases. And again, teachers sometimes need to quarantine or isolate depending. Um, so that staffing model with the building substitutes is working quite well. And at, so at our next meeting, we will be, um, I just moved my agenda, but we will we'll be second reading of our calendar. Um, I'm also going to be, I'm looking to bring forward the district calendar for 2021-22. We like to try to do that, you know, stay two years ahead where we can. And we're starting to get some questions for that, about that. Um, and then... Um, also, just a quick note, we have a professional learning day coming up on Tuesday uh, for the, on voting day. Mm -hmm. So we will be, there's no school for students that day, of course. And we will be um, engaged in professional learning activities with our staff. We are giving a remote option for that and uh, some more information to come after conversation with Vivian and whatever. So, there we go. And I think also important to note that uh, since our last meeting, we have welcomed, what, 7th, 8th, 11th and 12th back, right? I think it's, yeah, very important to know. Yes. Thank you. Yes, last week we had 7th come in and then our seniors came in on Tuesday and our 8th grade came in on Thursday. And just today our 11th grade came back, tomorrow our 10th and then Thursday our 9th. So in a couple of days we'll have 100% of our students uh, fully back in and that option available to everybody. And I anticipate the numbers will continue to go down as far as those students choosing to be on fully remote, which is good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Very exciting. All right, on that positive note, motion to adjourn. Sherry, second, Julie, all in favor? All right, thanks everyone, have a good night.